Thank you all for being here. I'm really glad that we are here to be able to talk together about thyroid health. I want to start by telling you just a little bit about me. There's a couple of disclaimers that I have to make. One is I am the founder of The Ingredient Guru, uh, so that is my company and what I do. I also am a uh, medical advisory board member of the Turner Syndrome Society of the United States. I am the chief health officer of a company called Third Rock Essentials. I am on the board of directors for the American Holistic Health Association, and I am an ambassador, meaning I talk kindly because I absolutely love their products, for Transformation Enzyme Corporation and Perk and Eliza Act Biotechnologies. I also need to tell you that I am not a doctor. I am a nutrition educator and a board certified holistic health practitioner. What that means is it is beyond my scope to answer medical questions for you about your thyroid levels, about your labs, about anything related to medication. I cannot tell you to get off your medicine. I cannot tell you to go on medicine. If you were to try and ask me any of those questions, I would have to refer you back to a doctor or your treating physician. So please simply be aware of that because that's beyond my scope of practice. The other thing that I want to mention is we're going to cover a fair amount of ground in today's talk. And so uh, we're going to talk about the thyroid gland. We're going to cover thyroid health and Turner syndrome. One of the things that I absolutely love about this group of people is I know you folks get as nerdy as I do about the science. You love to see the studies. You love to see the information. So I always include those in my talks. But we're going we're gonna to talk about specifically about thyroid health and Turner syndrome. We're going to talk about testing the thyroid because that's hugely important. There are some very missing components in current standard practice of care. And then we're going to talk about nourishing your thyroid and then CAM for the thyroid. CAM stands for complementary and alternative medicine. There are things that we can do in that lifestyle realm that are very supportive for thyroid health. And so we'll make sure that we will be covering that. So the incidence of thyroid health issues, I want to start by telling you that more than 12% of all Americans, that's not just the Turner syndrome population, that's everybody, will develop a thyroid condition at some point in their life. So just out of curiosity, if you are comfortable doing so, how many people in this room actually have a diagnosis of some sort of thyroid health? So almost everybody. Okay. So the rest of you are here to support somebody that you love, which is great because I believe in knowledge and empowerment. Approximately 20 million Americans currently have a thyroid disorder. And it's also important to know that women get thyroid issues five to eight times more than men do. Like, that's really amazing to me. It's kind of mind-boggling, but there is something about our biology and the way that our bodies work that make us as females more predisposed to having that. And then as many as one in eight women will have some sort of a thyroid condition in their <coughs> lifetime. And so that includes a broad range of things from a nodule, some kind of a lump that gets removed, uh, and then any of a whole host of thyroid disorders, some of which can fluctuate as we move throughout our life, depending on how we are nourishing, treating, and supporting ourselves. So the function of the thyroid gland. I believe it's really important for us to know what our thyroid gland does and why it's important that we pay attention to it. Because quite frankly, for those of you who don't know, although obviously everybody who has a thyroid condition in the room probably does know, the thyroid gland is located right here in the neck and it's this butterfly-shaped organ that is responsible. I actually consider it to be almost like our master gland. It's responsible for so many different things related to our health. And when we have issues related to any of these things, one of the first things that we need to remember to do is to stop and ask ourselves, is it my thyroid? Or to consider asking our doctor, is it my thyroid? Because some of the health issues mimic so many other things that sometimes the thyroid tends to be ignored. So the thyroid not only helps to regulate our body temperature. So if you're someone, for example, who gets cold all the time, even when it's really hot outside, you might have a thyroid condition. Um, body weight, if you're someone who struggles with body weight issues and you're maybe not able to gain weight or lose weight, both of those can be related to the thyroid. 
Um, it's also really important for our central and our peripheral nervous system. If you have tingling in your hands all the time or perhaps your lower extremities tend to have a little bit of neuropathy or you have other symptoms like that, there are a lot of different things with our nervous system that can be related to that. And that's part of why it's important to have a medical practitioner that you trust that you feel listens to you. If you think your doctor is not listening to you when you have concerns about things like that, I would strongly encourage you to look for a practitioner who is willing to listen to you because it's your body. You live inside of it 365 days a year. You know what feels normal and what doesn't. And so you need to make sure that people listen to you. It's also um, responsible for cholesterol levels. So our cholesterol levels rise and fall in, in uh, you know, comparison to what's going on with our thyroid. So if we start having all kinds of cholesterol issues, we may want to consider looking at the thyroid gland. It's also responsible for heart rate, our muscle strength, and although the Turner syndrome population does tend to have a higher than average incidence with menstrual cycles, it is important to note that menstrual cycles are also strongly correlated with what is going on with our thyroid gland, and so we need to pay attention to that. The thyroid gland, as I mentioned, is one of the glands in the endocrine system. It takes iodine from the foods that we eat, so it's really important to make sure that we are getting enough iodine. And I am here to assure you that if you are all like average America, which I'm pretty sure you are, you may not be getting enough iodine. Most of us don't, especially if we don't tend to live in coastal areas. Um, and by the way, the iodine that's in your iodized salt that is the wrong kind of iodine. Your body cannot utilize it properly in order to support your thyroid gland. Um, so it takes the, the iodine and it makes the hormones triiodothyronine, which is T3, and thyroxine, which is T4. And then the other endocrine gland systems, the hypothalamus and the pituitary, work together and help us to balance those levels of T3 and T4. And so that's something that we need to look at. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into testing. Your hypothalamus also produces TS, uh, sorry, thyroid releasing hormone, which frequently doesn't always get tested. Frequently when you go to the doctor, they're looking at your TSH levels, your thyroid stimulating hormone. And we're going to talk in just a minute about all of the different testing that we need to look at and to consider asking for. But TSH is very important. We still need to test it. I'm not saying we should ignore it because TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, is what tells the body what to do with the levels of T3 and T4. But you cannot use your TSH level alone as the only measure of thyroid health. Like if you go to the doctor and they say, oh, your TSH is fine, and you're like, I still feel like crap. Well, uh, that means that there's a problem potentially with some of the other numbers, and we need to consider looking at those as well. So there are several different types of thyroid disorder. I'm not going to go into all of them. I am going to talk about what is too much and what is too little. I mean, the other diseases all branch off of those two things. Those are the primary issues that we are looking at. So if we have too much thyroid hormone, we can be very anxious, we can be moody. It, it really has an impact on our neurotransmitters, on our brain state, and so that's something to keep in mind. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't other reasons why you can't be moody and upset and irritable. That happens a lot. We're humans. You know, we are complex beings, but thyroid can sometimes interfere with our ability to regulate our emotions, and so it's certainly something to consider. If you're someone who has a lot of hair loss and you, know, you, you have looked at your micronutrient status and you've looked at other body systems, you can't seem to find an answer, your thyroid may potentially be partially responsible for that. It also, um, you, you know, sometimes people who are hypothyroid, they have a couple of things in common. One is that they tend to be very edgy, very nervous. They're, they've got a lot of activity, like they're shaking a lot or they're just very moving a lot. And that's because their thyroid gland is working overtime, pumping so much hormone into them that they kind of can't sit still. They also sometimes have trouble sleeping. So that all kind of goes together with that. You can have missed or light menstrual periods. And again, we have to take this against, this is a standard for that. 
Obviously, there are other issues with menstrual regulation that uh, specifically impact the, thyroid, the Turner syndrome population. Sweating, if you're someone who tends to sweat a lot all the time, you have frequent sweating issues, either your sweaty palms, you over sweat in uh, your armpits or your feet get very sweaty, or you just sweat a lot all over your body, that kind of inability to thermoregulate is, can be tied to too much hormone. And then also sensitivity to high um, temperatures. And then sometimes there is something called a benign essential tremor. And it's called benign essential tremor because it's not a harmful tremor. It's not something like you have some sort of neurological disorder, such as Parkinson's or anything like that. But you just have this generalized small tremor that can be due to the overstimulation that's happening because we have so much hormone in the body. Conversely, we have hypothyroidism. And one of the things that's very interesting is you'll see that there are some things that actually go both ways. So if you have too much or too little, we still have certain issues that affect us, or it's affecting similar body systems. And again, that's because our thyroid is our master gland, and it does affect a wide range of function in our system. So we can have depression, difficulty concentrating, dry skin and hair. So your hair may not be falling out, but you may be someone where your hair is very dry, it's very brittle all the time. Part of the reason for that is our hair and our nails are actually leftover protein. So as our body is getting protein from what we're eating it, and turns it into what it can use, the excess gets used to create our, our hair and our nails. And so if our hair and nails aren't growing well, or they're very dry or very brittle, that means that we may not be getting good protein metabolism, and so we may want to look at that. And again, it could be because of the thyroid, it could be because of our diet. So those are certain things that we want to look into. Frequent heavy periods, joint and muscle pain. This time it's sensitivity to cold, so we're kind of going the other way. Trouble sleeping, and that can be where it's trouble sleeping because you go to sleep, you feel like you're sleeping, but you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I could go back to bed. I'm so tired. And you know, you're not getting a deep enough sleep. You're not getting restful sleep. So that's certainly something to consider. And then tiredness and fatigue. Again, that constant feeling like you're walking around in a fog because you're you're almost, you know, sleep drunk, if you will. You don't have enough sleep. And so it gives you that disassociative feeling. Okay, I don't know what happened with that. That would be my slides messing up. Um, so <laughs> this is a study that we looked at. And you can see here it was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. It talks about hypothyroidism being very common in the Turner syndrome population. It was a five-year follow-up. And um, essentially, what we can pick out from this is that uh, it was the incidence of hypothyroidism in the Turner syndrome population is 25% higher than in the general population. So there is a very significant impact of thyroid malfunction simply because you have a, a diagnosis of Turner syndrome as well. And one of the reasons that we pay attention to that higher diagnosis is because that becomes another level of care that we need to look at when we're looking at all of the other associated health conditions that go along with Turner syndrome. To be aware that thyroid, especially if it's someone who's starting to experience different levels of health you know, challenges that they really don't have a good explanation for, they're not really sure what's going on, to understand that thyroid may be a very significant percentage of that simply because it does appear more often than average in the Turner syndrome population. And for some reason it did it again. Okay, well, thyroid autoimmunity in girls with Turner syndrome. So one of the things that, you know, basically this particular study, which was in the um, Advanced Expert Medical Biology Journal, simply states that it's important to monitor thyroid function in patients with Turner syndrome. This particular study was looking at a broad range. They looked at 41 girls aged 6 to 18 years, 
And what they determined was if you have Turner syndrome, even if you are not experiencing thyroid health issues at the moment, it is really important that you simply continue to test and monitor the thyroid gland in anybody who has a diagnosis of Turner syndrome. And I apologize for these slides. I don't understand why this is doing this, but um, we will make sure I know that they are going to be releasing a copy of this because I've given permission for the recording. So we'll make sure that these slides get cleaned up before they get to you and it's available. It's so weird. Um, so one of the other things that was really important is um, this particular report was looking at positive antibodies and elevated titers in people with Turner syndrome and with the isochromosome issues that seems to somehow be responsible for causing some sort of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disorder. So it falls under the category of hypothyroidism because you don't have enough hypo, sorry, you don't have enough thyroid hormone. But the difference with Hashimoto's is because it's an autoimmune disorder, it is actually your body seeing the thyroid gland as a foreign body and developing antibodies that attack the thyroid gland and destroy thyroid function. And so the treatment for hypothyroidism versus Hashimoto's thyroiditis is slightly different. And again, I'm not a doctor, so we're not going to go into like the technical treatment protocols behind the two. But just for you to know that if your doctor says to you, you don't have enough thyroid hormone, you are hypothyroid, it's very important to ask them to make sure that you clarify, is it hypothyroidism or is it Hashimoto's? Because they are, they both have low thyroid level, but they, the protocols to treat them are very different. Um, and then it also said that uh, patients with Turner syndrome do have an increased risk of thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So testing for thyroid health. You know, I've been alluding to what's going on with thyroid health and with testing. And so we're going to talk about the different testing things that you need to know. And this is because you need to be very active participants in your own health care. Like I am here to empower each and every one of you. When you are sitting in your doctor's office, if you have thyroid health issues, to understand what they are testing, what you are asking for, and to make sure that they don't simply, you know, do a baseline thyroid test, which we're going to talk about in just a second, that they go a little bit further. Because you can have normal values for those baseline thyroids, like I was mentioning before, and still not feel good, and that's because your other numbers are off. So you really need to have a complete picture, and that means looking at a lot more numbers. So typically when you go to the doctor and you say, gee, I don't feel good and I think it's my thyroid, they may or they may not agree with you, but if they agree with you or if you manage to convince them that you're right, and they'll say, okay, great, I'll test your thyroid. And they test your thyroid stimulating hormone, that's the hormone that tells your body how much thyroid hormone to produce, and they'll test your T4, your thyroxine. And sometimes those numbers come back normal in the normal range and you still don't feel good and they think, well, it can't be your thyroid because these numbers are great. Well, that's where we need to dig a little bit deeper. And one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is a what I call a, a full panel, which isn't a complete panel. So when I say a full panel, I'm talking about the first two categories. So that means we include the free T4. This is the amount of T4 that is unbound to protein. So it is circulating in the system. And then we also want to be looking at your T3 because the body uses T4 to make T3 and you can have normal T4 numbers but not have normal T3 numbers. That means your body's not converting it. You're making it, but it's not going anywhere. And so we need to know about that. We need to make sure that we understand that. We also want to know how much free T3 we have. So T4 is, we're looking for free T4 unbound, Free T3, that is bound to protein. So the body treats those very differently. We need to be aware of that. And here's the thing. You don't need to know what all those are. You don't need to know what the ranges are. You just need to know that these are the things you need to ask for. 
So you want to ask for free T4, T3, free T3. You also want to know reverse T3. And this is one of the most important ones that, in my opinion, a lot of doctors, if they're not used to dealing with someone who perhaps has what's called subclinical hypothyroidism, they don't always think to look at this one. But this is a form that can bind to your receptors, but the body can't do anything with it. So it's there, it's in your body, but if you have too much and that's binding to your receptors, it's preventing the active form from attaching to your thyroid gland and then you're having problems. So that's why we wanna look at that full panel. Now, if you're continuing to have problems or that you think there are some other issues going on, then you can look at some of the other things like your thyroid peroxidase antibodies and that tends to be very elevated in people who have Hashimoto's. In people who have Graves disease, not so much. So if they suspect Hashimoto's, then you wanna ask them, can please run my antibodies? Although I will say in all fairness, if a doctor suspects Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the vast majority of them are gonna run your antibodies because that is the conclusive way to tell if that's the issue going on. The other is you wanna look at your um, thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies because that's the reverse. Very low in people with Hashimoto's, very high in people with Graves disease. So if you have an overactive thyroid, then a hyperactive thyroid, then you want to know if it's due to Graves disease because the treatment protocols for that are drastically different than what you're doing for someone who has hyper, hypothyroid, underactive thyroid. And so you would need to run your TRAB in order to make sure that you're getting accurate numbers. Whoop, did we miss one? No, okay. So iodine, iodine is very important. I talked about that. We need iodine to make thyroxine. And one of the things that's really important is you do need to test your iodine levels and the way they test your iodine, not great, not a whole lot of fun, but definitely necessary. They give you some iodine pills, they make you swallow all of them, then they make you walk around with this little orange jug and collect all of your pee for 24 hours in the jug. And then at the end of the day, you sort of swish it around and then you filter it out into some little test tubes, send it off to the lab. Why do they do that? Because they need a 24 hour period to see how much iodine your body is holding on to. And the only way they can do that is because they need to see what you excrete from what you take. So you simply ask your doctor for an iodine test and then they give you this, it's this whole kit, and they just either give it to you or mail it to you and you go from there, it's all done through the mail and then the doctor gets the lab and then they tell you, yes, you're holding on to too much, no, you're not holding on to enough or yay, you're just right. I will say very few people, just right. <laughs> so most of us are not balanced with our iodine levels. Um, the other thing that is really huge, did you have a question? Oh, okay, sorry. The other thing that is really hugely important is that thyroid can adversely impact our cortisol levels, our adrenal glands. So our adrenal glands, for those who don't know, are these two tiny little things on top of our kidneys. And they are responsible for our cortisol levels. And we produce cortisol in response to fight or flight. Everybody knows that, you know, we get all excited and stimulated and lots of cortisol and adrenaline and all those kinds of things. But cortisol also happens to be very, very important for sleep. And that's because the hormone cortisol and the hormone melatonin respond in opposition to each other. So when cortisol is high and melatonin is low, we're awake, we're active, we're ready to go. When it's the other way around and melatonin is high and cortisol is low, we should be sleeping. The problem is we have, we should have a normal cortisol curve. And if we don't have that, then we're not sleeping very well. And they did find that there is an issue between thyroid stimulating hormone and cortisol levels. So if your TSH is off, your doctor needs to be testing your cortisol levels as well. And I'm here to tell you that as, as a nutrition educator, I have a medical director that allows me to order cortisol labs, 
but um, I still have to defer to him for diagnosis on what's going on with that. So you need to make sure that it's somebody who really understands the test and what they're doing, but you also want to make sure that you are getting the correct cortisol test. Um, whoop, hang on. Where did... Uh, Oh, it's at the bottom, I'm sorry. It's at the bottom of that slide. So one of the things you see, that particular thing at the bottom, that is a four-point cortisol test. And that's what you want. You do not want a single-point cortisol because you could be spot on for that one point and way off for the other points. You want a four-point, and it has to be salivary. What that means is you can't take cortisol from the blood. I, I personally feel that that is not an appropriate indicator. It is better to get it from your saliva. So they send you these little tubes and you have to spit. It's a lot of spit, believe me. You have to spit into these tubes, but you have to do it at certain points during the day. And then they tell you what your curve is. So this person has a perfect curve. They fall exactly where they need to. For people who are having cortisol health issues, they could have a reverse curve. They could have an unbalanced curve. They could have a steep drop and a flat line. There, there's a lot of different things that can impact our cortisol levels. And if our cortisol is off, that's going to trash sleep. It's going to affect you metabolically. It's going to impact your thyroid hormones inappropriately. And so then you need to work on correcting and supporting the adrenal glands. And that, my friends, is a whole other talk. So we'll have to save that for another time. <laughs> so the other thing that's really important to know for hypothyroidism, and I just pulled up this one because that tends to be the more common incidence in people with Turner syndrome, there are a lot of micronutrients that are strongly indicated for how they impact the thyroid and its ability to function. So if you have a deficiency in any of these um, micronutrients or multiple numbers of these micronutrients, it can impact your thyroid. And so one of the things I strongly encourage people to do is to find a practitioner in your area who can run what I call, a, the company name is down there, SpectraCell, who can run a SpectraCell micronutrient test. It's a blood test. It tells you on an intracellular level, meaning inside the cell, what your micronutrient status is. And then you have the ability to make changes to your diet, to supplement if necessary, to do other things within the, you know, your lifestyle protocols, to be able to address that micronutrient deficiency so that you will be able to better support your thyroid. So now we're going to talk, yes. So that's a great question. The question was, if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, is it better to just go diet alone or are the micronutrients still important? The micronutrients are still important because even though it's an autoimmune disorder, the body requires these micronutrients in order to have appropriate thyroid function. You're going to have to do some other things to support the Hashimoto's as well because then we have to look at a whole autoimmune body protocol. But uh, just to be aware that I, I'm a huge fan of micronutrient testing when we have any kind of, of bio dysfunction because so much of what we do is based on our body's ability to take the nutrients out of what we eat and then use it for all the different body functions that we need it for. And so you can see, for example, you know... Um, Vit uh, deficiency of vitamin B6, B12, or B9 can cause elevated homocysteine. Homocysteine is an inflammatory compound. And so you can have, you know, there are other health conditions that are inflammatory in nature. And so you may have B vitamin deficiencies there as well. So I just, I tend to be a big fan of micronutrient testing. And by the way, if you have a hard time finding a doc in your area who does it, although I will share, you know, personally in, in my area, like I know uh, gynecologists, cardiologists, uh, you know, other, other mainstream doctors who run this test. Um, if you can't find one of those doctors, 
A lot of chiropractors run this, and then you can also contact the company itself directly, Spectracell Laboratories, on their website, and they can help you find a provider who can run the test for you. Yes? Oh, okay. Yeah, and so it's just a matter of reaching out to your to your docs and you know and asking them, can you run this test, um, and going from there. And if you if you your doctor says no, then just my suggestion would be to contact the company or see if there's a, a chiropractor or a functional medicine doctor. They typically do identify themselves as functional medicine. Uh, they tend to do this test as well. So nourishing your thyroid. You know, one of the things we really want to do is make sure that we are getting good, whole food, nutrient-dense nourishment for our body. And that's for anybody, all the time, 24-7. Like, I don't care what your health condition is. That's how we all need to be living and eating and supporting ourselves. However, it turns out, whoop, did that just move by itself? There we go. Um, however, it's really important to note that when you have thyroid health issues, you can also have gut health issues because the gut really is the center to so much of what is happening with our body. If we don't have a healthy gut, the rest of us isn't going to function very well. We need good gut status in order to be able to break down our food, to extract nutrients from it, and in order to process a lot of different things, I don't know if any of you remember from uh, previous years, but 80% of our neurotransmitters, our brain chemicals, are actually produced in our gut. And so if we don't have a good gut, that means we're not making good brain chemicals and we're not properly processing amino acids and all these other things that our body needs. So, so our gut health is very important. And so this lists, you know, a number of different things. Hashimoto's disease can be associated with esophageal motility disorder. It means things don't move through the body the way that they should. Um, we can also have heartburn, nausea, delayed gastric emptying, sometimes referred to as gastroparesis. And then we can also have, you know, flatulence, bloating, all different kinds of health issues. So again, if you are having a whole bunch of gut health issues, one of the things you want to do is make sure that you're getting that looked into, but to also consider, is there a thyroid component to that? And if you're someone who has a thyroid disorder, you want to pay more attention to what's going on with your gut and make sure that you're being, being nice to your gut. Uh, one of my, my mentors, a woman named Dr. Liz Lipsky, has a, a term that I absolutely love. We have more cells in our gut then, sorry, we have more organisms in our gut than we have cells in our entire body. And she refers to these little organisms as our pets. So if we take care of our pets, they take care of us. And when we're having gut health issues, we need to stop and think, what are we doing? How are we feeding our pets? Are we watering our pets? Are we being nice to them? Are we taking care of them? Because in turn, that means that they will help to take care of us. Celiac disease, one of the other things that's really important, so now we're starting to see something called a cascade effect. So we tend to have, you know, a higher incidence of thyroid disorder in the Turner syndrome population. Well, now it turns out that in the, in the autoimmune thyroid population, we tend to have a higher incidence of celiac disease. So by a show of hands, how many people know what celiac disease is? Is there anybody in here that doesn't? So there's a few people that don't know, so bear with me for just two seconds. Celiac disease is a genetic disorder where your body cannot properly process the proteins that are found in <coughs> gluten. It's, it's called glutenin and gliadin. These two proteins, your body can't break them down. And inside our gut, we have something called villi. It's like little shag carpet. And if you have celiac disease, over time, your body keeps wearing down these little villi until eventually your Berber carpet turns into, into you know, sorry, you're in, over time, your shag carpet turns into Berber. The problem is, once those villi are destroyed, they cannot be regrown. The body doesn't make new ones. So if you are someone who has thyroid issues, I strongly encourage you to consider going gluten-free. And a gluten-free diet means not eating any grains that contain gluten in them. And so I'm going to give you a mnemonic to write down, please. It's BROWS, B-R-O-W-S, like eyebrows. 
and the way to remember it. So that's the, the mnemonic. And what it stands for is barley, rye, oats, wheat, and spelt. So here's the spelt, S-P-E-L-T. It's sort of an old-fashioned kind of wheat. Now, here's the thing. Oats in and of themselves don't necessarily have gluten, but because in this country they tend to be grown with, stored with, transported with wheat, there tends to be a lot of cross-contamination. Yes, did you have a question? Um, I was testing for celiac disease. But does that necessarily mean I'm not gluten? Great question. So she said, I was tested for celiac disease and I don't have it. Does that mean that I don't have to worry about gluten? Not necessarily. Which leads to my next point, which is there is a condition called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it means you don't have celiac disease, but you're still sensitive to gluten. And believe it or not, there's a, a very large percentage of the population that has that health issue. So what I generally recommend is that everybody go on a gluten-free elimination diet. Now, do I think everybody on the face of the planet should be gluten-free? No. And I will stand here and tell you that there are people out there who go, everybody should be gluten-free. It's bad for you. It's terrible. Glutens are, you know, killing humanity or whatever. I don't believe that. I'll be with you in just a minute. I don't believe that. However, I believe everybody should try a gluten elimination diet because if you remove gluten from your diet for six weeks... And all of a sudden you notice, gee, my belly bloat went away, or gee, my shoulders don't hurt anymore, or some of my itching and rashes have gone away, or all these other health conditions are going away. That probably tells you that you are having an issue. I had one person who told me that within seven days of giving up gluten, they noticed they they used to have a lot of flatulence, like more than average, and it went away. Because for them, gluten was an issue, and that was how it expressed itself. You know, I have an awful lot of people who find that, well, it just, you know, it's basic biological function. But uh, I have a lot of people who notice that bloating goes away, inflammation goes down, they feel more energetic, all those kinds of things. So I do encourage everybody try an elimination diet. At the end of six weeks, if you need to, you can add it back in and then see how you feel. I have some people, like I have a lot of case studies in my own practice where people would go on a gluten elimination diet and they'd be like, I'm fine. Like I didn't have any problem whatsoever. I'm like, great, let's add it back in, see how you feel. Like have a bowl of pasta, have a sandwich, have something that's got gluten in it. And they call me, they're like, I don't know what happened. I feel like I got hit by a Mack truck. Because all of a sudden they were like so tired after eating the gluten. And that's because they hadn't had it for so long that when they ate it, their body went, whoa, and they just had this major impact. So you need to pay attention to the messages that your body is giving you. So I know a couple of people had their hands up. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions. I'm sorry, I know I keep answering in the middle, but I really do want to make it all the way through. And I promise if we go through this, I'll, I'll have enough time for questions at the end. All right, so foods for your thyroid, these are all the things that are really good for us, that we should add more of these to our diet because these are nutrient-dense, nourishing foods. Brazil nuts, for example, are fabulous for us. And now, you know, one of the things that is really important to remember, when we are eating nuts and seeds, raw is best. We don't want them all cooked in oil or even dry roasted and all of that kind of stuff. We want raw nuts and seeds. Why? Because those are the ones where the good things in them haven't been, haven't been, uh, you know, changed or modified by the, the process that it takes to roast them. Now, the absolute top best quality is to sprout or soak them. And so one of the things that we strongly encourage people to do is to sprout raw nuts and seeds because there is an invisible coating on it called phytic acid. And that phytic acid inhibits your ability to absorb certain minerals like calcium and iron and that kind of thing. And so when we sprout, we remove that. I'll be really honest. Most of us 
don't have a lot of time in our day to be starting to sprout all kinds of nuts and seeds and do all that and have all these kitchen experiments. So in that case, I encourage you to look for sources of that online. I know that there are certain companies that do sell sprouted nuts and seeds that you can, you can buy them online. Some of the larger grocery stores like Whole Foods has them. Um, I think, I, I don't know if Trader Joe's has, well, Trader Joe's has sprouted seeds, I know that. Um, so just look at the grocery stores in your area and see what you can find. Coconut oil is huge. Coconut oil is a medium chain fatty acid, very beneficial for our metabolism, definitely something that you want to add in. The easiest way I, can, I consider adding coconut oil to the diet is to encourage people to simply start cooking with it because that way you're getting the benefits of it, but you don't have to like eat it by the spoonful. Some people do like it enough that they eat it by the spoonful, but that's really not, not my bag. Uh, I, the other way that I like it is I will take a tablespoon or so and throw it into a smoothie. However, please trust me on this one, melt it first. Because <laughs> if you throw it in just the way it comes out of the container, especially if it's in the, in the cooler months of the year when coconut oil is solid, you get these fatty little globules and that's just disgusting. Um, if you melt it, then it will blend completely and then you get this nice creamy consistency. The other thing that's really important to know is yes, I'm gonna answer that unasked question right now. Coconut oil is a saturated fat. That means that it is solid at cold temperatures and it is warm at, sorry, it is liquid at warm temperatures. That is okay. Your body knows what to do with coconut oil. It knows how to process it and it loves the caprylic acid, the lauric acid, all those beneficial compounds that are in that medium chain fatty acid. Cruciferous vegetables. Does anybody want to give me an example of a cruciferous vegetable? Cabbage, cabbage broccoli, cauliflower, yes. So all those cabbagey foods that have that sulfurous smell to them, those are crucifers, and they're really good for you. We should be eating more of them. Now, some of you may have heard that cruciferous vegetables are highly goitrogenic and should be completely avoided in anybody who has thyroid issues. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, Iodine-rich food. So here's the part where because we don't tend to all live in coastal areas, and even if we do, we don't eat enough sea food, um, we may be low in iodine. Iodine is found in things like sea vegetables. Sea vegetables, those are seaweed. Kombu, wakame, hijiki, nori, all of those fabulous things are really, really good for you. If you don't like them, I would encourage you to try either dulse, D-U-L-S-E, which is a form of seaweed that comes in northern cold coastal climates. It's very, very mild, and it's got a great salty flavor. What I encourage people to do is to uh, get by the dulse uh, flakes and sprinkle it on things instead of salt. Kelp flakes are another thing. Kelp is almost undetectable, um, and it, you can buy it in little shakers as flakes, so you can add that as well. And then also scallops, cod, shrimp, sardines, salmon, tuna steak. Are we seeing a pattern here? All of the cold water fishies. And I'm here to tell you that one of the best things you can do for yourself is sardines. Now, full disclosure, and I always have to throw this in, I have a true food allergy to fish, all of it. I can't eat any of it. I go into anaphylactic shock. It really kind of annoys me because I was 27 when it happened. Um, but I am still going to firmly defend the fact that you need to be eating sardines and cold water fishes. They are so healthy for you. Please add them to your diet at least two to three times a week. And then also eggs are a good source of iodine and yogurt. But when I'm talking yogurt, I'm not talking like a Yoplait fruit on the bottom or fruit mixed in yogurt. I'm talking a good quality, organic, whole milk, plain yogurt, like made the old fashioned way. That's the best kind of yogurt for you. Chlorophyll is another great thing that is really, really supportive. It's very detoxifying to the body as well, which is very supportive for thyroid health. So if, we're, if our detoxification pathways are open, we're functioning much better. And so with that, with chlorophyll, I will say it doesn't always taste great. So most people don't like the powder. So if you're going to take chlorophyll, I'm going to recommend that you just get the tablets and swallow those suckers down. It's the easiest way to take it. And then maca powder, which is sometimes referred to as Peruvian ginseng. This is an adaptogenic plant, meaning it 
adapts itself to be whatever your body needs it to be. So it's highly supportive for the hypothalamus and the pituitary. It has a bunch of nutrients in it. A lot of people take it for energy. Some people take it for hormone balancing. But maca powder is a really great thing to add. Generally, um, if you follow the instructions on the package, they recommend starting at about a quarter of a teaspoon and then slowly working your way up to half or three quarters of a teaspoon of maca powder. Avoiding these foods. Gluten, we've already talked about, so I'm not going to address that again. Soy. So, you know, in America, we apparently have a love affair with soy. I quite frankly don't understand why. There was this whole thing called the China study. Anybody heard of that? The China study? A couple hands go up. So the China study basically said that, Gesundheit, the China study said that uh, Asian women who ate soy had a lower incidence of cardiac health and breast uh, cancer than anybody else. And so all of a sudden, soy came to America, and man, we eat more soy than the Chinese do. Why is that? Because they eat small amounts of fermented soy. We make soy everything. You can have soy milk, soy breakfast, sausage, soy, um, you know, soy meat things for lunch. You can have soy chicken for dinner. Like, you could eat soy every meal of the day. So we're eating way too much. Soy also happens to be the most genetically modified food on the face of the planet. That in and of itself is a whole other talk, but I'm here to tell you GMO is really bad for you, and I strongly encourage you to avoid it. Coffee. I know, I'm hearing a couple of people going, I don't like you very much right now. So I'm here to tell you that unfortunately coffee can interfere with iodine uptake. Coffee is not great for people with, thi with thyroid issues. Here's the other thing. If you're someone with adrenal health issues, thyroid is like pouring fi gasoline on a fire. It is going to make your cortisol and your adrenal health issues even worse. And so I do strongly encourage people who have thyroid health issues to give up the coffee. If you absolutely have to have coffee... I'm going to encourage you to limit yourself to one six-ounce cup a day because really, if for, for you, bio-individually, it is not a good choice. And believe me, I've had people in my practice who drink 10 cups a day, and I'm like, that is so bad for you on so many levels. But really, you, you need to consider this is for your health. And so I really encourage you, cut it down a little bit at a time and get yourself down to that six ounces. I'll, I'll answer questions at the end. Sorry, we're just... I really want to make sure that we have enough time to get through. So goitrogens, here we go, about goitrogens. Here's the thing. Some foods are classified as goitrogenic, meaning that they interfere with iodine uptake. So when we eat those foods, it means that our body can't process whatever iodine we've got to support our thyroid, and so supposedly that increases the issue with thyroid health. However... It is no longer believed that you have to avoid them completely. We do believe that you should limit them, not have a lot of them, and instead of having them raw, to consider having them steamed or lightly cooked. So broccoli, for example, raw broccoli, maybe not a great choice. Steamed broccoli, go for it. Uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to have, well, I don't know anybody who eats raw Brussels sprouts anyway, but uh, you know, if you want to have Brussels sprouts or cabbage or those kinds of things. It's better to have them steamed or lightly cooked because that does reduce the goitrogenic activity of those. And then using a food journal, perhaps see how often you have those foods and can you maybe cut them down and substitute in some other vegetables that would be just as delicious and just as healthy for you but not have that same impact. Are those peas? No, those are Brussels sprouts in the middle. <laughs> so Brussels sprouts, radishes, yes. Okay. Um, so this is a list. I encourage you to take a picture of this. This is a list of all of the goitrogenic foods with the beautiful cabbage in the background. So I'm going to read them while you're doing that for anybody who is listening to this on the recording. I'm so sorry. I, I'll, I'll answer in a minute. So bok choy, broccoli, broccolini, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cassava, collards, cauliflower, daikon, which is a type of radish, kale, kohlrabi, millet, which is a pseudo grain, mustard greens, peaches, believe it or not, peanuts, pine nuts, radishes, rutabagas, spinach, turnips, and watercress. So this is the no-no list? This is the, it would be better to have it steamed or lightly cooked list. So rather than eating these raw, it's better to have them as a cooked food. So peanuts can be roasted? 
So peanuts could be roasted. Here's the thing. I'm not a huge fan of peanuts unless they're organic and even then in moderation. Peanuts tend to have, first of all, they're a fatty little legume. They're not really a nut. And secondly, they tend to have a higher than average incidence for a particular type of mold called aflatoxin. So we eat a lot of peanuts or use a lot of peanut oil, we can potentially be exposed to a lot of mold, which can cause a lot of inflammation, which then you know becomes a downward cycle. But yes, roasted peanuts, if you were going to have peanuts, um, or boiled peanuts actually would be good too. Broccolini is a green vegetable that's related to broccoli. It's it's long. It looks like um, it looks like a broccoli that's been stretched. <laughs> no, there you go. So other thyroid health strategies, and I am trying to get through this quickly so that I can make sure I have time for questions. Um, so hydration, it is really, really important that you make sure that you are well hydrated. And this is not just for thyroid health, by the way. This is for everybody. Most of us are chronically dehydrated. By the time you feel thirsty, you're already one quart down. So please make sure that you are staying focused on hydration. The formula for hydration is right here. I encourage you to take a picture of this slide. And again, I'm going to read it for anybody who is simply um, purchasing the recording. You calculate your body weight, divide that in half. That's the number of ounces. So for example, if you're a 150 pound woman, you divide that in half, you're looking for 75 ounces of water a day. So generally, to make it a little bit easier, I encourage you to divide that number by eight. That tells you the number of cups of liquid that you need per day for hydration. And then you divide that number by four and the reason I want you to divide it by four is because I want you to set a hydration alarm on your phone at 10, 12, 2, and 4. And every time your alarm goes off, you set your number of liquid of ounces in front of you, and your goal is to drink that before the alarm goes off again. And restroom break at 10, 15. <laughs> <laughs> right, a restroom break every 15 minutes thereafter. But here's the thing. It's also important to note that this does not mean plain water. Too much plain water can also not be good for you. Like if you start drinking, you know, four gallons of water a day, you're going to run into something called hyponatremia, which is where your body dilutes your blood salts so much that you start passing out and you don't feel good. So essentially what we're looking for is hydration. If you're having soup, that counts, as long as it's not too salty. If you're having herbal teas or foods like celery, cucumber, watermelon, things that have a lot of water in them, those can count in moderate fashion towards your hydration goals. So simply to be aware of that. Now, one of the things that's really important is that it is there are studies that very clearly show for those with thyroid health issues, dehydration contributes in a big way to thyroid function and hormones, what's going on. And so we want to, you know, if we look at the bottom here, triiodothyronine, which is uh, T3, resin uptake increased after hydration. So they started hydrating people and their T3 went up. So, you know, that's, that's one of the important numbers that we talked about, remember, that the doctors don't always look at. So in order to keep your T3 numbers where they need to be, you want to make sure that you're doing it up. Okay. So please take a picture of this slide. Sorry, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to go really fast here. Um, it is really important to know that chlorine and fluoride, which are two chemicals that tend to be in regular municipal water, compete with iodine for receptor sites on your thyroid. If you are drinking commercial tap water or if you are drinking bottled water, most bottled water does not come from a mountain stream regardless of what they say, they pull it out of a municipal facility, throw it in a bottle, put a high price tag on it, and sell it to you. So if you want to avoid that, you need to filter your household water. And then I encourage people to do things like get a metal or glass water bottle and bring your water with you. Uh, so this is a course by a friend of mine that talks to you about how to choose the right water filter for your home. And the course is normally uh, $149. She has it on sale for $99 right now. I called her right before the conference, and I begged her to give you guys a discount, so she gave you an additional 10% off. If you put TSS10 at the end of that, you will get an additional 10% off the course to learn how to pick the right water filter for your home. 
Essential oils. Please take a picture of this slide because I don't have time to read this. But Dr. Maritza Snyder is the author of a book called The Essential Oils Hormone Solution. And she has a whole chapter just on, or not a chapter, but a whole section just based on thyroid health. There are essential oils that are very supportive and very healthy for the thyroid. And so you can use these blends. And I have instructions on how to blend them there as well. I'll leave that up for just a second before we move on. Can we move on? Everybody got the picture? Okay, good. Yoga. Yoga is huge. How many people in here do yoga? Yay, ish. Well, so uh, it looks like we've got about 20% of the hands up. I would love it if we could have all the hands up. Yoga is so important for everybody. It is a great de-stressor. It is good for flexibility, mobility, balance, core strength, and it is hugely important to help our well-being on a number of different levels. And one of the things that they discovered is that patient life satisfaction scores improved after embarking on a yoga practice. So I'd like to encourage all of you to find a yoga studio, a yoga video, a yoga program online, subscribe to Yoga Magazine, like something, anything. Please start including this in your life. Acupuncture is another thing that is very, very important, and there are a number of studies, I only pulled one, that show that it does have a positive impact on treatment for thyroid disorders. So I do recommend that you go to a licensed acupuncturist, so you want to see L period A, C period after their name, meaning they are a licensed acupuncturist so that uh, they will be able to give you the treatment that you need to support your thyroid as well as any other health issues. And then um, we do find that meditation is very helpful and very supportive. Uh, so meditation-based stress reduction, which is what MBSR stands for, induced emotional and behavioral changes related to functional and structural changes in the brain. So this means basically if you engaged in meditation, a gratitude practice, mindfulness, stress relief, any of that, that actually changes how your brain works and that changes how your whole body processes. I do have a couple of books out at my booth. One is called Beyond Meditation, Making Mindfulness Accessible for Everybody. If you think you can't meditate because you think you have to sit there cross-legged going om, I'm here to tell you I can't do that either. So there are dozens of different ways to meditate in this book. So you can incorporate that. The other is I strongly encourage people to add a gratitude practice. This is simply a gratitude journal. Three minutes, once or twice a day. I promise you at the end of two weeks, it's going to completely change your outlook on life. Give it a try. And then really quickly, in summary, do proper testing for thyroid health. Be your own best advocate and make sure that you are getting the care that you deserve. Eat nourishing thyroid supporting foods because we want to love all of us. And then avoid toxins such as chlorine and fluoride to the very best of your ability and incorporate self-care strategies. So do we have... Yeah, we can take a couple of questions. Okay, so we can take a couple of questions. Okay, yes. So the question was, I mentioned maca powder, how about turmeric? Turmeric is a great choice. It is anti-inflammatory. However, it does not have the same impact on thyroid health as the maca. So, no, turmeric is great. I love having turmeric in the diet, but I'm saying it's not, there aren't, uh, there aren't as many specific thyroid health um, related studies. Yes. So, uh, the lots of green tea stuff started to come out and be more popular, especially in like Seattle or where we're from. Yeah. So, maca green tea. Yes, that would be great. Because green tea has uh, ECGC in it, which is great for you, and then it's got the maca as well. Yes? The coffee. Coffee. Is it the caffeine in the coffee, or is it the coffee itself? It's the coffee itself. Even decaf coffee is not a good choice. It's the acids in it that can be um, really impacting it, although the caffeine doesn't always help either. Um, so if you need caffeine, then I would encourage you to look at why you need that much caffeine and is there something else that we can do to support health? All right, well, maybe Mira can stay around for a couple yes, of minutes. Yes, I can stay for a couple of minutes. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.